Good day, everyone. How y'all doing? Okay, some thumbs up, good. Hope things are nice in spite of the rain. Uh, we are about to have a nice long weekend, which I know I appreciate. I assume you guys do too. And I hope that it ends up being a nice one. Uh, might need to turn the screen back on. That would probably help. Today is October 8th. The only thing due today is the chapter 4 homework and quiz. That is due by midnight, and then there will be no assignments on your end uh, until we get back next Wednesday. Uh, I would like us, I am planning on us beginning chapter 5 today here in lecture, uh, but I'm not going to post any new assignments after the homework is due tonight because I don't want you to have anything you need to work on over the weekend. Because at least when I was a student, if there was an assignment to do, I would not rest until it was done, and then my weekend was done. So, uh, tonight, the homework will be due. Make sure to work on it and send me any questions you have as you're finishing it up. And then, take a nice long nap, please. I need one. I know that for a fact. Uh, next week, there won't be a lab, and we will resume for normal lecture on Wednesday the 13th. Um, my plan for class today is, well, I'll, as soon as I remember how to talk, uh, I'll open the floor in a second to any questions that you guys have from the homework, and then we will begin a cursory dive into chapter five. From SC, you got are, an extra toothbrush? I brought everything but a damn toothbrush, bro. At least the parts that are immediately relevant to the forces and friction stuff that we've been looking at. Um, Additionally, not really an announcement, uh, I feel more scatterbrained than normal today, which is saying something for me. I don't think I slept well, and something between that and the weather is maybe I needed more, maybe I needed more breakfast than I actually got. I, I feel like I'm losing my place mid-sentence and that my dialogue is slightly less coherent than normal. I apologize if that is the case. Feel free to call me out if something I said makes absolutely no sense. All that said, any questions, comments, concerns, needs, etc., from you guys? All right. So, um, Chapter 4 homework, how's it going? Any lingering issues from you guys before we, uh, we finish it up at the end of the day? Yes? Four. Which one is four? Ah, yes. So, four actually also has a similar setup to some of the other ones we have been looking at. I'd say the one it's most close to would be seven. It's probably easier than seven in that one of the objects is hanging vertically downwards, so there's fewer forces on it. And there's also no friction, so there's fewer things to keep track of here. That said, it's still on an incline, which does still make life harder than it otherwise could be. Uh, in order to set up number four, where I advise to go about a similar tactic as six, seven, and eight, where we need to analyze the net force on both objects separately, create one equation for each of those uh, objects, and I actually have uh, the starts for those up here right now. Uh, mass one is labeled as the hanging mass, and the two forces that are going to act on it are tension up and gravity down. So those two forces on object one need to add up to become uh, its mass times its own acceleration. 
I've already indicated that gravity should point downwards. Then object two is the one that's on the incline. Thankfully, friction is not a thing in this problem, so that's one less thing to need to pay attention to. However, we are still on an incline. That does still make things weird. On an incline, normal force and gravity are no longer equal and opposite, and our tension is on an angle. And it's actually not even in the exact same axis as the other two forces present. Now, if you haven't had a lab yet this week, this is, again, something we're going to be looking at there and looking at the math for. If you have not had lab this week, then this triangle on this part of the board right now is designed to show the relationship between gravity, the new slanted normal force, and the sum of those two vectors. Because whenever an object is sitting on a ramp, it's probably going to begin sliding down the ramp, but that movement is parallel to the ramp's surface. Neither normal force nor gravity point in that direction, but when you add them together, their vector sum points in that direction. So neither of these things by themselves is the reason that things that slide down a ramp, but then added together is the reason why things slide down ramps. So in this type of situation, I create this triangle where gravity is the hypotenuse, normal force is the long leg, and a, they're added a sum. I label that as F down, strictly because it's the force that pushes down the ramp. You could call it whatever you want. This is actually the combined force that will push the box in this direction, or at least try to. Which one of these is more mass? Okay, yeah, it's going to slide up the ramp. Or was I? Okay. And I've already distracted myself. That one's dead now. So, all this to say that for the second object, we only care about its movement parallel to this surface. Gravity does not point within that axis. Normal force does not point within that axis. We only care about this movement because that's the axis that tension is in. So, my advice for all slope questions is to shift your axes such that your x is now parallel to the run of the board, or run of the incline, so that we don't have to divide all of our forces up into their vector components. Instead, all you will need to do is use this triangle, where gravity is the hypotenuse, the angle is the same as the angle of the triangle. Specifically, this lower angle is the same as the angle between gravity and normal force. And then the leg opposite that angle is the summation that I call F down. After finding F down, it will be the thing that is opposing tension in our new slanted axis. Therefore, the only two forces present in this new slanted x-axis, tension and F down, have to add up to the mass times acceleration of object two. It is okay that we use a slanted axis for this object because we're looking at an entirely separate axis for object one anyway. And we kind of need to because this is the axis that tension exists in. And we're specifically trying to compare the tension on both objects. Once you get to this point, we've again approached a situation of two equations, two unknowns, like six, seven, and eight, 
where tension is the same in both and A is the same in both. And it's important to make sure your directions are consistent. F down will point down the ramp, whereas tension and acceleration will point up the ramp. So I've set tension and acceleration as negative and F down as positive for that reason. Does that help? Yeah, I didn't, it was a friction, but I didn't know what Okay, yes. If friction doesn't exist, then you just ignore it, it just factors out completely. And usually if a question doesn't tell you friction exists and it doesn't give you a mu, you'll be able to assume that it doesn't. And that obviously doesn't happen much in real life, but sometimes it's just easier in our problems to assume it doesn't exist because it's a pain to factor in. Also, only one of these objects is touching the ramp, so it, it, it's less important in this case to be there. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> Any other homework-related issues? Yes? Number two. Two. Which one is two? Two. All right. Two is a vector addition question. Um, May I ask if the angle is what's causing an issue? Yes. Okay. Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about two, and fairly so, because when people have been doing the vector addition for this question, you break down the components, you add them together, you're likely to draw your new picture for the combined vector sum as something like this which makes a lot of sense. You would have just found the x and the y leg of your new summation vector, and you would probably solve for this angle. This marker's dying too, and now I'm sad. Two markers left. <coughs> Which, again, if I was a human being, I am a human being, if I was the one grading this, I'd think you find this angle, that's just fine. The problem though, WebAssign is a dumb robot poo poo brain, and it wants its answer to the right of the forward direction. Which means that to do that, the picture would look a little more like this. And you'd be solving for, I'm going to call that not theta. You'd be solving for this angle. But that would be the complement, complementary angle to the one that you've already found. So if I was to work this and get like 81.7 here, 90 minus that answer would give me the 8.3. 37 of what the sign actually wants. That's the thing I've noticed causing the most trouble there. Again, because web assign don't think no good. So let me know if that doesn't fix the problem. Uh, any other homework related issues? Okay, uh, I would now like to begin looking at chapter five, uh, just to give you something new to think about over the break. No, no assignment related to it yet, but at least something to think about, and to go ahead and get it in your notes. Chapter four, we've been talking about forces, different types of forces, how they interact, and probably the one we've been spending the most time on recently is the force of friction. We're now going to apply those things to the next logical topic that utilizes them, and that is the physics, uh, physics concept of work. Now, complete concept question, no wrong answer. You've been exerting forces on objects your entire life. You've been lifting, you've been pushing, you've been doing any combination of things involving your own muscles. When you exert a force on an object, is that action free to you? Is there no cost to exerting force using your muscles? Is 
it's a, it would be most apparent if you were lifting a lot of heavy objects for long periods of time. Does it cost your muscles and your body at large something to use your muscles and exert force? Getting some nodding. Yes, it does cost you something. It costs you energy, which you then have to recuperate by eating food and sleeping, and physically your muscles fibers get tired, although I am not, I am less qualified to talk about the mechanics of the biology of that. Point is, it does cost you some tangible thing. It costs you energy. And work is how we calculate the energy cost that exerting a force tolls on a human body, or even on a mechanical system. Uh, now, work is a word Work is a physics concept. It's not very well elaborated upon in common American English vernacular. Uh, usually when someone just using the English word work in normal day-to-day -day life, you're referring to like work at your job, work performing a task, have you done your homework, nothing to do with this physics principle. The physics definition of work is the use and transfer of energy, which can alternatively be redescribed as the transformation of energy. We will define energy more formally in a minute. Uh, for now, though, we, we, meaning physicists, take this particular definition and have created several formulas about it, but this is the first one to look at today. Work, the variable for work is W, which thankfully makes sense, unlike some of the later ones we're going to talk about. Work equals force times displacement. To do work, based on this classical physics definition, you have to exert a force on an object, and that object has to move as a result of you exerting that force. Which means, if, say, your parent or guardian asks you from the other room, have you done your work yet today, as long as you have picked up and moved a pencil, you can successfully say yes. They'll find out later, but at least for those five seconds, you're in the clear. Now, the way this formula works, to calculate the work that you do using, the work that you do when using force to do any sort of a task, uh, you have to multiply the force times the displacement and the, that P, that P is there as a placeholder because I keep forgetting to change it for the symbol it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be parallel. That stands for force parallel. So I'm going to further specify that on this part of the board. Work equals force parallel times the displacement that is parallel to that force. I will elaborate on some of the technicalities involved in this, in this pardon me, by looking at a very quick sample question. Let's say you have a large box that you are going to push horizontally across a nice, flat, frictionless floor. You are going to exert 50 newtons upon this box, and it is going to slide 10 meters in the direction that you are pushing it. At the same time, because we live on Earth, the box has a weight of 100 newtons, which will point down in the vertical axis. The two questions that we have been asked are, one, how much work do you, the person pushing the box, accomplish in this scenario? So I'm going to relabel this as work me. To find that work, you're going to multiply the force you exert by the displacement of the object as a result of that force. You use 50 newtons of force, it slid 10 meters. The answer comes out, excuse me, the answer comes out to be 500. Excuse me. Now, who can hazard a guess what 
what the correct unit for this answer is. Is okay. Uh, lost my train of thought already. So work is the use and transfer of energy. And so when you solve for work, you are solving for the energy it took you to perform that task. So this number represents the energy that you used. Therefore, the unit for this answer will be the metric unit of energy. Any quick guesses as to what that is? A little louder? Joules. Actually, I can't tell where that sound came from, but good job to whoever said it. The metric unit of energy is joules, and that is spelled like the French physicist, uh, not like the pretty rocks in the ground. It is abbreviated to a capital J. There is another unit of energy that some of you might be more familiar with, and that is the calorie. They are both used in scientific circles, but they both have slightly different de definitions. Physicists tend to use joules. I find calories tend to be used mostly by, by biologists. Sometimes I think chemists probably use calories a little more often than joules. I think chem majors in here agree. Rough nodding. A couple different answers, that's fine. Um, but they both measure energy, and they're both fairly academic answers to give. There is a straight conversion from one to the other. I think it's, it's either one joule is 4.4 calories, or one calorie is 4.4 joules, and I keep forgetting. Uh, it's worth noting, though, this is not the same as the food calorie on your packages, but that is still a unit of energy. It's just that's a kilocalorie which is very confusing, and I don't know why we do that. Uh, for this class, we're going to stick mostly with joules, though, because one joule is defined as one newton times one meter, but it's also defined as the amount of energy needed to cause one gram of water to increase its temperature by one degree Celsius. Or maybe it's one kilogram. But everything there is nice and metric, and that's what we're going to stick with, because that's what our formulas are designed to give us. So this is the energy that it took you to perform this task. And in performing this task, you used up this energy, but you also transformed it from one state into another state a couple of times, actually. Um, feel free to correct me, because again, I'm not super qualified to talk about the biology side of this. But I believe that there's chemical energy stored inside your body, which your muscles transform into mechanical energy to perform mechanical tasks. The, that mechanical energy will transfer out of your muscles and then become mechanical energy inside of the box while the task is being accomplished. And eventually that mechanical energy will just become thermal energy that got robbed by friction. 